All right, uh, I think it's time to get started. So uh, welcome all. Uh, tonight's seminar is uh, titled Towards Zero Violence, Putting Gender into a Theory of Violence and Society. Our speaker tonight is Sylvia Wolby, who is a professor in the Department of Sociology at City University London and leading a center on violence and society. She has been a distinguished professor of sociology, UNESCO chair of gender research, and the director of the Violence and Society UNESCO Center at Lanc Lancaster University between 2005 and 2019. She is a fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences and chairs the sociology sub subpanel for REF. Her books include Crisis, published by Polity in 2015, Globalization and Inequalities, Complexity and Contested Modernities, published by SAGE in 2009, the Concept and Measurement of Violence Against Women and Men, uh, published with colleagues uh, in 2017. Uh, Stopping Rape, uh, again, uh, written with colleagues, uh, published by Policy Press in 2015. And The Future of Feminism, published by Polity in 2011. Our discussant tonight is Colette Harris, who's sitting over there right now, uh, who is a reader in Gender and Development here at the Department of Development Studies at SOAS. She has worked on issues such as violence and conflict, governance, post-colonial state building, Muslim societies, sexualities, reproductive health, migration, and community development. Prior to joining SOAS, she was in the School of Development Studies at the University of East Anglia and a fellow at the Institutes of Development Studies. Her books include Muslim Youth Tensions and Transitions in Tajikistan, Westview Case Studies in Anthropology, uh, published by Westview Press in uh, 2006, and Control and Subversion, Gender Relations in Tajikistan, uh, published by Pluto in 2004. Uh, if you'd like to tweet during uh, the seminar tonight, please use the hashtags SOISDevStudies and ESRC. So, uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and welcome. Towards zero violence, a bit optimistic? Or is that our goal? And why not have such a goal? Violence varies enormously. Why shouldn't we think about how to understand, explain and theorise violence with a view to ultimately ending it, or at least producing it? One of the questions in the field is whether violence is increasing or decreasing. Seems a really simple question. Extremely controversial. The government in Britain says it's decreasing. Is it? What do we mean by violence that is so contested? Where do we draw the boundaries? What are the implications as to what we include within the category of violence and what we exclude from it for answering that question about whether violence is increasing or decreasing? How do we think about it? Your social science students, where is it in your social theory where is the theory of violence in contemporary social science theory? And what about gender? Obviously, violence is gendered. But how? And what are the implications of taking different ways of thinking about it? Is this violence against women? because women are the political subject of the politics of ending violence? Or is that too narrow? Is this violence, which is gendered, and we should be mainstreaming gender throughout the analysis of violence, and we should be including men in the analysis so that we can make some of those comparisons? So, asking the question of how the violence is gendered has at least two 
strategically different answers. So, those are my questions and starting points. <coughs> Everybody, of course, says it matters. Um, United Nations Sustainable Development Goals has got some wonderful goals and targets. Goal 5, target 2.2, is to eliminate all forms of violence against women and girls. And they're going to measure it in order to measure progress. And in a few years' time, is it 2030? We're going to end all violence against women and girls. I like it. That's the gender one. And then we have the gender-free one, which is goal 16, target 16.1, which is to significantly reduce all forms of violence and related death rates everywhere. So that's in goal 16, where gender isn't very visible. So within the UN, you've got these two different ways of thinking about this. When gender is there, it's about violence against women, which should be ended. And the other way of thinking about violence isn't to mention gender at all. Is that good enough? The European Union has a different strategy through gender. And we'll usually discuss gender in terms of gender equality and gender mainstreaming rather than violence against women. Council of Europe has got a hybrid. Istanbul Convention talks about combating and preventing violence against women and domestic violence. Let's have both. So it's both got the gender specific term of violence against women and the degendered concept of domestic violence. So while each of these transnational bodies, international bodies, identifies the importance of ending violence and notices usually that gender is relevant, they address gender in quite different ways even in their goals and targets. So, violence is gendered, ending violence is gendered, but in different ways. What about social theory? I'm going to divide Western social theory into two groups, before and after 1945. Before 1945, sociological theory, Marx, Weber, Durkheim, Elias, talked about violence. Violence was relevant. Contemporary social theory has tended not to talk about violence as something which is separate and specific form of power, but rather to disperse and fragment it, integrate it into other forms of power and lose its separate identity. That's not to say that they don't use the term violence, but they lose the specificity of violence as a specific form of power with its own rhythms, modalities, effects, logics, and consequences. It's dispersed. So one of the challenges is to make violence visible in social theory so we can ask about theory, and as UN and DFID would say, their theory of change. Let's make the violence visible within the theory so we can do that. And the route through this that I'm going to argue for is to treat violence as a specific form of power as a specific institutional domain in its own right. And when we've done that, when we've made violence visible, empirically and theoretically, to address that question 
are whether violence is increasing and decreasing, and the best way to think about the gendering of that violence, whether it should be separate or mainstreamed. So why has violence disappeared in sociological theory? Classic sociological theory, social science theory, took for granted that violence was part of the world. After 1945, after 1945, the hope was that violence had been vanquished. There was peace in Europe in 1945. There was the assumption that there was peace and that violence was no longer a primary target. And the new institution the new institutionalizing of the disciplines of the social sciences didn't treat it as a significant object of inquiry in the way that they had before. So the move today to put violence back into social science theory has come as a consequence of the pressure from a variety of social movements and political projects from feminists, from anti-racists, from activists in the global south who have argued for the significance of violence, who have documented it empirically and raised the question then as to how should it be integrated into the canons of contemporary global social theory. So the early writers Marx treated it, violence as instrumental power, just assumed that power could be used by the state to crush the revolutionary movements, and that revolutionary movements had to use violence as part of their revolutionary struggle. It was just taken for granted that violence was relevant. Weber's account in sociology was that the state would develop in modernity a monopoly on legitimate violence in a given territory, was core to his theory of the state, that violence would be concentrated in the state instead of being dispersed throughout society. And this was part of his theorization of modernity, this concentration of violence in the state. So it was a really important part of his theorization of the modern state. Uh, Merton, in the 1930s, drawing up, uh, uh, would argue that Violence was from the disadvantaged. The people would use violence and criminal activity because of the structures of inequality. And this was from the disadvantaged. Elias, another classic social science theorist, assumed that the what he called the civilizing process, his words, not mine, was a process in which um, violence would reduce. And contemporary writers like Pinker draw upon Elias in their large-scale theorizing, which claim that the civilizing process has reduced violence in modern society. So what about some contemporary writers? Those are really old classic writers. Foucault. Where's violence in Foucault? It's in the past. For Foucault, violence was part of the brutality of the old kind of state. Hung, drawn and quartered was what the state did to criminals to make an example of them to do them in public. The modern forms of power were governance through the soul, not through brutal displays of violence. Modern forms of power for Foucault didn't involve physical violence. Really? Bourdieu he uses the term violence, but he calls it symbolic violence. He disperses this 
into the symbolic. Violence is part of the habitus. And victims of violence are complicit, Bourdieu's words, in the violence because they have absorbed the practices as part of the habitus. Ugh. What, no protest? Really? Zizek discusses subjective and objective violence, yes. But for Zizek, Violence is the violence of the capitalist system which causes the economic inequalities which cause hardship and suffering. And the physical contact violence, which is domestic violence, violence against women, is merely subjective and not as important as the structural violence of capitalism. So he uses the terms <coughs> But the physical violence he thinks is unimportant as compared to the class dynamics of capitalism. So the significance of the feminist claim of the significance of violence is lost on him. Rather we have the account of the significance of class inequality of capitalism as being really important and physical contact violence such as violence against women, domestic violence, rape is not as important. So those are our contemporary social theorists of Foucault, Bourdieu and Zizek who have been challenged by the scholarship from the margins Gender-based violence against women has been documented worldwide. Abraham, Dawson, Ray, Pandran, Agarwal, Hanafi, Grinberg, Donna, Von Holt, lots of writers have documented the significance of gender-based violence. Hate crime, based on race, ethnicity, religion, gender identity, disability, is documented in multiple forms. Ray, Igansky, Balderston, and many others. Colonial violence. Fanon is still the classic writer on this, Van Holt, Anafi, Grinberg. The significance of colonial violence. And what about warfare? Warfare is endemic, Shaw, Hart, Negri. And the state, unlike Foucault, is understood by writers like Wacant and Tilly as coercive. And Gal Tung's theorization of violence is that violence breeds violence. So a challenge to some of those major canonical uh, theorists. So what does this mean? It means that physical violence matters. And the physicality of the violence matters. Collins, I think, is particularly interesting in how he describes this. If violence is significant, it shouldn't be reduced to something else. It's got a very specific kind of effect as a form of power. It's not like other forms of power. The pain and suffering it causes, the modality of it, its rhythm, its temporality, the consequences, the long-lasting consequences, the fear that it generates, are very specific forms of power. They're distinctive and worthy of distinctive conceptualization of analysis. Contra Elias, this is an argument that violence is instrumental power, not a consequence of lack of self-control. So Elias's theory was that violence occurred when people didn't have self-control and that with modernity you would have an increase of self-control and therefore you get a reduction of violence. But if you see violence as actually a form of instrumental power, then the self-control argument is irrelevant. 
power as a form of instrumental control, then alas, his argument that an increase of self-control will reduce violence is voided. If violence is understood as instrumental power, and we recognize the significance of gender-based violence from men to women, hate crime from dominant ethnic, sexual, able-bodied groups to those with less ability and minoritized sexual and ethnic statuses, then we're seeing violence from the dominant groups to the less dominant groups, contramerton. This is a contradiction to the fundamental theorizing of most contemporary criminology, which assumes that violence is, comes from the disadvantaged upwards. This is a challenge to Contempor much contemporary criminological theory which assumes that the violence is bottom up because this is a claim that it's top down. Let me not overgeneralize about criminology. There are plenty of criminologists out there who understand this as a tension within criminological theory, but it's certainly a challenge to the criminological theory inspired by writers like Merton. And states use violence for governance. They still do. Contra Foucault. So this is an argument that violence is a very significant part of especially non-class forms of inequality. Regimes of inequality of gender, ethnicity, disability, have violence as a significant part, as a significant institutional domain in these regimes of inequality. And it is hard to understand these regimes of inequality without understanding, documenting, and theorizing violence. Violence matters. Okay. So those are the challenges from the new scholarship. So the conclusions I draw from that are that we should treat violence as a social institution. An institutional domain, a field of power. And that it should be understood as parallel to other institutional domains, such as the economy, polity, and civil society. That is, there are four major institutional domains, economy, polity, violence, and civil society. They're distinguishable even as they have effects upon each other. Of course, they have effects upon each other, but they're analytically distinguishable and not to be reduced to each other. So this is reducing, this is rejecting the reduction of violence to culture, as in Bourdieu, and it's rejecting the assumption that the state has a monopoly of violence, as in another set of writings. So this is saying that, that violence is an institutional domain in its own right, that the different forms of violence are interconnected, and that we understand violence as a specific um, field. that violence shouldn't be reduced or dispersed to anything else, and that the different kinds of violence um, are interconnected. Okay, so that's the theoretical claim, that's the direction in which I'm wanting to move the intellectual debates about the place of violence in social theory. I'm now going to go a bit more empirical. So, what does it mean? Well, violence varies enormously. And it really matters why it varies. Understanding the reasons for the variation in the violence create the basis of understanding what, 
how violence could be reduced in the future. You understand that the causes of the variations, you can understand and build a theory of change. So, rates of violence do correlate with economic and political inequality. There's more violence in countries that are more unequal than countries that are less unequal. One of the examples which I use in globalization and inequalities is a comparison of the European Union with the United States of America. And Americans kill them, each other at a five times greater rate than Europeans, despite being richer. They are much more unequal. And the inequality in the, the greater inequality in the US is part of the cause of the greater amount of violence in the US as compared to the European Union. The rate of femicide also varies around the world. Here, one of the few correlations which we can identify from the very few data sets that we've got is that where there are more women in parliaments, there's a lower rate of femicide. The more women are in the institutions of political representation, parliaments, the lower the rate of femicide. The rate of femicide doesn't vary in a simple way with rates of economic development. It does vary with levels of gender democratization. So here I'm making the argument that the concept of inequality should be extended to political inequality and not just economic inequality. That's between countries. What about over time? Is violence going up or is it going down? Pinker, drawing theoretically on alliance, has made an argument that violence, in Europe at least, has been declining over centuries. He's making the claim, based on some empirical work, on changes in the rate of homicide, which are contested by writers like Milosevic. So the data, the empirical data, on changes in the rate of violence are quite complicated and quite controversial, and the methodology is really quite contested. And it's that contestation over the methodology that I, I kind of want to move into next. So it matters how you exactly define violence and what exactly you mean by it and how you measure it in order to answer that question about whether violence is going up or if it's going down. And with some colleagues, um, Towers and Francis, uh, we took on how the Office of National Statistics was measuring violent crime in Britain in order to challenge the, the government account that, that violence has been declining. And that, for that, we drew on uh, some data from the Crime Survey for England and Wales and some very detailed analysis as to how you should measure uh, violence uh, in Britain. And we argued that it wasn't going down in the same way. And in particular, it went up in the economic crisis. Um, between 2008 and 2012, we argued that violence went up. And it wasn't just violence in general which went up. The violence which went up was repetitions, which is domestic violence in particular, and because it's domestic violence, which is disproportionately against women, this was an increase of violence against women. But you can only see that if you're willing to count repetitions. Now, you might think that's not very controversial. It's incredibly controversial as to whether you count repeated acts of violence or whether you say, if it's once, that's enough, 
or maybe you count it up to five, and that's enough. And we are arguing that if people are reporting to a survey that has happened to them lots of times, then you should record it and use it in your estimates. And that has been extraordinarily controversial, and we're still involved in a public debate with the Office of National Statistics as to whether or not we should be including all the incidents of violent crime reported in the crime survey in Wales, or whether it should be capped. The Office of National Statistics used to cap it at five. We argued they should include them all. They've come back saying they're going to cap it at the 98th percentile. For the statisticians among you, that means they're going to include up to 98% of it. For the rest of you, it means they're capping it at 12. They've increased the cap, but they're not including all. The argument we had with them was that they argued that it changed the trend. We argued that if victims were reporting to the crime survey that this violence had occurred to them, it should be included. So this debate continues. So the methodology affects whether or not you say violent crime is going up or going down, and the proportion of violent crime, uh, which is against women, and the proportion of violent crime, which is domestic violence. <coughs> so that's our argument with the Office of National Statistics. And you'll notice in that there's an issue of capping at one. And this is to my friends in the violence against women service sector who want to count victims, who want to focus on the number of victims because they want to treat victims as a whole person. And treating them as a whole person really matters. But if you count them only as one, then you've reduced the amount of violent crime against women and if you've reduced the amount of domestic violence, you've ended up capping it at one. So if you count all the multiplicity as a single course of conduct, for example, coercive control as a course of conduct, then instead of you counting it as 20 crimes, it's one, which has implications for how much of the violent crime the government recognises as being against women. So, methodology matters. So let me move to a focus now on that issue of gender, which I keep flagging. How should gender be thought about in these analyses? In police recorded crime, crime of assault, you can't find the amount of domestic violence, you can't find the amount of violence against women because violence against women is not recognised as a crime code in its own right. So none of the official police statistics will record the amount of violence against women or the amount of domestic violence because it's not a crime. Another set of statisticians, Fundamental Rights Agency, for example, in the European Union, argued that when we collect data, what really mattered was to understand the amount of violence against women. Count the number of victims. But they didn't count the violence against men. So you can't compare what's happening with women with what's happening with men. You can't ask the question of what proportion of violent crime is against women, because you've only got the figures on women. The third position, which you can see I'm arguing for, is to ask the questions of both men and women to always gender disaggregate and always report on it. 
So you've always got the gender profile of the victims, the crimes, at all of the different levels, so that you can identify the different nuances of the gender profile of each of the different forms of measurement. That is always gender disaggregate. Simple? So the strategic alternatives have been to collect data on women only, which is where UN Women has gone, Fundamental Rights Agency has gone, or, as we're arguing, to collect on both men as well as women and then gen gender disaggregate. What do I mean by gender? I mean the sex of the victim, the sex of the perpetrator, and the gendered relationship between the perpetrator and the victim. And one of the gender-saturated relationships is whether there's a domestic relation, uh, in particular whether it's an intimate partner or other family member, which is different from whether that person's an acquaintance or a stranger. In a sense, the whole world is gendered, but these are differently gendered categories. And if we're to understand the gendering of violence, we need to understand the extent to which it takes place in intimate partnerships, other family relationships, as compared to acquaintances and strangers. We also need to understand whether there's a sexual aspect to, to the violence. For example, rape is a form of violence which may not be domestic. It might be, but it might not be. So those are the different aspects which we need to collect if we're going to properly gender the data. Just quickly, most surveys will collect the data on both women and men, not all. Some will, some won't. Most administrative data collects it but doesn't publish it. They've got it buried in their files. The police know the sex of the victims. They just don't publish it. Could they? Of course they could. What would make them publish it is if it were statutory. That is, if you gender disaggregated the offence of assaults, they would have to report on violence against women and violence against men. And we would have official numbers of the numbers of violent crimes committed against women and against men. And the precedent for that is rape. Once upon a time, rape was understood as a crime that only men could commit against women. And then in 2003, they widened the definition so that it became something that men could do to men, indeed something that women could do, by widening the, name, the number of objects and orifices. But what they did in order to be able to keep track of the extent to which rape was against a woman, they separated the offences into rape of a woman and rape of a man, so you can still see it in the official statistics. You could do exactly the same for assault, but we haven't. So why include men? It's needed to address what is currently a very live debate about the extent to which domestic violence is against women or is against men. It's really controversial. Half the world argues that it's overwhelmingly against women. Another half of the argument says, actually, men are a significant part of the victims. The data needs to be collected so as to produce the proper scientific basis on which these arguments can take place, rather than to collect the data which fits your argument. So this is an argument for collecting the data so we can test these positions uh, which are held. If we include men, then in the data that we had from the Crime Soviet England and Wales, which did collect the information on both women and men, then you can see that um, almost half of violent crimes of violent crimes against women. That's utilising a very conventional definition of violent crime, that is physical contact crime, and half of violent crime is against women. It's not tiny, it's not minority, it's not the case that most violent crime is men against men, it's not the case that most violent crime is male stranger on male stranger, nearly half of violent crime is, is against women and most of that is from men that the women know. It's not minority at all. Um, but you can only make this argument if you constantly ask for the gender disaggregation of this data as we go through it. And th so the data that we've got 
um, is an argument that we can then see the changes if you collect the information on both women and men. And you collect the information not only on the victims and the perpetrators, but also on every single incident, every single repetition which has happened. Counting repetitions matters. Repetitions are gendered. Right. To omit repetitions means that you can't see the gender of violent crime. So those are our different trends. If I, you left this one. This is violent crime going up. If you include all of the violent incidents reported, then in this column you can see it's going up, particularly domestic violence. These are the traditional British government figures, and this is what happens if you have a victim. So it makes a massive difference as to whether or not you think that violence is going up on whether it's disproportionately domestic and against women, if you count all the repetitions. So, if you count all the repetitions, then the pattern is that we've got a narrowing of the gender gap in the victims of violent crime, because the rate of violent crime against women has been going up. We've got more crimes, but not more victims, because certainly during the economic crisis, it was the repetitions which went up. And that analysis, that data has implications for how we think about the causal pathways. Is the causation to be thought about in terms of what the perpetrators do, their motivation, or is it to be thought of as changes in the resilience of the victims, the resources that the victims have? Two quite different ways of thinking about the explanation of these changes. One is to focus upon motivation of the offenders, the other the political economy of the resources attached to the victim. Do you think of violence as linked to changes in culture or as part of a resources and political economy? Is violence to be thought of as a distinctive form of power? Or are you going to think of it as absorbed back into your concept of culture? Hmm? See, I'm making the argument for keeping it distinctive and not absorbing it back into your notion of culture. So one of the questions there is, well, is it the case that victims have different levels of economic resource. And it's that which adjudicates between the different theorizations of domestic violence. We know that the greater repetition and seriousness is gendered. And what we investigated was that correlates with lack of economic resource, not only earned income, which is the classic way in which this has been analysed, but also access to property and to housing. This is learning from our colleagues from the Global South who focused on property and applying this, this lesson back to the Global North, saying, what about property, housing, and whether or not you had your kind of housing tenure 
is also part of your economic resource, not only your earned income. And the less economic resource you've got, whether earned income or housing capital, the more likely you were to have suffered repetition and, and serious injury in the domestic violence. So we've, we've, got, we've got a correlation here between the violence and issues of political economy. So, so this is an argument about the significance of the interconnection between violence and forms of economic and political e economic inequality. And that changes in the wider political economy have implications for rates of violence. That the, we've seen an increase of violent crime in Britain in recent years in the crisis, during the period of the crisis. It's been disproportionate against women, disproportionately from domestic perpetrators, and disproportionately against those with least material resources. You can only see it if you count the repetitions and you gender disaggregate all of your data so as to make these comparisons uh, between women and men. And the claim here is that the explanation of this increased rate of violence against women lies in gendered political economy and the changes in the economic crisis. So the wider theoretical implication of that is that we need to, is that violence matters, that the empirical research has the capacity to change how we theorize and we think about violence and to underpin the theoretical developments in which we think of violence as a distinctive institution and form of power, but nonetheless interconnected in a wider theory of society with issues of economy, polity and civil society, but nonetheless having a distinctive place. Thank you. such an interesting presentation and really convincing I think in, in, in the ways it looked at um, what's going on and how the theorists have ref in a sense refused to deal with a lot of what's going on and therefore have in a way hidden the issues and perhaps one could say then facilitated the way our governments seem to be totally refusing to to deal with these things. If, if the theorists and the academicians are not dealing with violence, how can anybody else deal with it? So I think that's, that shows that theory, it may seem abstruse and something that has nothing to do with real life, but in fact it has a lot to do with real life. So the way the theoreticians then discuss violence then has, um, as Sylvia showed, a, a clear um, explanation for for how that affects what governments can actually do with the violence. And also that gender is absolutely connected with violence. I think a really important issue that perhaps would be interesting to hear more about is the connections between the whole structural issues that you talked about at the start um, and where you ended up at, um, with the ideas about um, at the the people at the bottom. So you did connect it with the political economy, but perhaps it could have been connected more with some of the structural issues that go on in terms of racism, in terms of the way that despite the equality laws, gender and women's issues at any rate 
are still a serious issue in this respect. And I wonder how much the whole issue of not just gender equals men or gender and women or women, um, but gender in terms of the norms of gender then apply. Because if we look at the way the international community treats um, conflict-related violence of a gendered kind, in particular sexual violence, we can see that there's a great reluctance of the international community to think beyond outside the box of quite narrow gendered norms, so that they can e fairly easily accept notions of men and masculinity as being violent and women and femininity being victims, but anything else is really a problem to deal with. And I wonder how much any of this thinking inside, refusal to, uh, uh, to see outside the box of the norms influences some of the ways in which violence is being conceptualized or refusing, refusals to conceptualize it. Um, I think it would be interesting to explore more in terms of what you're looking at in the UK, how much this plays a role. How much, one thing I've noticed that there's a lot of reluctance on the part of men in really high positions in the UN and governments, etc., to accept masculinity as an important issue because I think they don't want to um, interrogate their own masculinity. At least I feel that, that that's the way. Men at the bottom seem to be more, more um, willing to look at masculinity issues and even examine their own masculinity than the men in the positions of power. How much does that relate to the, the almost willful blindness towards issues of violence, I wonder? And also towards issues of structural violence that cannot, I think, be separated from the direct physical violence that you talk about here. Um, so it's not just the political economy, of course, that is very important, but all kinds of other ways in which we, in this neoliberal world we live in, have structured societies that try to make invisible the gendered ways in which power is being applied, not through men and women, but through notions about proud, um, privileging what is associated with masculinity and inferiorizing what, or taking less note of what is associated with femininity, making that into principles of governance and then forgetting about the fact that it came from the gender perspective. So I wonder whether those things um, could be something to be added to what you're doing and would be in any way helpful. But I just think that we all of us in this room realize that we've learned a great deal today from Sylvia's presentation and that it is really a very, very useful contribution to our thinking about violence. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, so we'll open up to questions. Uh, would you please raise your hands? Um, yep, yeah, just here at the front. Do, do we have microphones? That's a good question. Oh, yeah. Oops. Easier, sounds better on the recording. Oh, yeah, just over there. Thank you for your contribution. I was uh, particularly interested in one um, um, in the correlation between the femicides and um, the representation of women in the um, uh, yeah, decision-making structures. Um, is this a pattern that kind of uh, characterizes developing countries? Do we see that in developed countries as well? Um, because like, for example, like in my particular experience uh, in my country, in Albania, uh, we've never had so many women representatives in the parliament, in the government. But on the other hand, we did, we never had so many femicides, like at least 10 uh, cases mediatized the last two months of women killed by their intimate partners or family members. Uh, because on the other side, we have this, um, it's become more clear that um, the head of the executive is this authoritarian misogynist figure 
which uses the gender to kind of um, tick the boxes of some kind of uh, European uh, houseworks that we need for the integration process. So does uh, this correlation, do you think that it can uh, be found on the other side of the world as well? Or? All right, yeah, any others? Yeah, just right next to her. Yep, yeah. oh, thank you. Hi, um, thank you very much. I'm going to do my dissertation on violence, so this was uh, extremely interesting um, and useful. Um, I was just wondering more about war, because you were talking, uh, I think, on, on crime and on GPV. I'm studying women, peace, and security in LSE and I'm Israeli so um, I'm very interested on the occupation and GBV and looking at the way that violence as you said uh, operates as a power so I was just wondering are there um, researches or what do you think um, about war and, and GBV and other forms of violence as you were saying about interconnections thank you and yep yeah, just over there in the second row Hey, thank you. I've actually got loads of questions, but I'm guessing there are loads of hands behind me, so I'll keep it really brief. Um, I did want to briefly stick up a little bit for Foucault. Um, you can take pot shots at Zizek all day, but I do think that um, Foucault has been used by feminists to um, theorise violence, and particularly perhaps violence in war, which perhaps makes it different to the specific cases that you're looking at. Uh, but my question is about um, coercive and controlling behaviour that you mentioned and the effect that that's having on the stats. Um, I've, I have the impression that that's been a big breakthrough in terms of legislation on violence against women in terms of recognising the dynamics that the victims of violence associate with um, the particular traumatic bonding that goes on in an intimate partner relationship and that's been reflected in the law and I have to confess that I was surprised I didn't know until you presented it that that had had the effect on the stats that you'd said I erroneously assumed that they'd be counting the emotional abuse that is captured in that law and the assault separately right? so it wouldn't actually have that effect is it possible to have a middle ground in terms of keeping the stats on assault, which should surely be kept separate, and also recognizing domestic abuse as a pattern of behavior as encapsulated by that law. Yeah, okay. Um, homicide and women's political representation. The, the data on which I made the analysis was a global data set so it included countries in the global south as well as the global north. And it was a correlation. So it was a cross-national data set. And uh, there was a correlation at that one moment in time uh, between the countries which had high proportions of women in parliament having lower rates of femicide. The, when I investigated whether or not there was an economic effect, I couldn't find one. So that meant that wasn't just a question of higher rates of economic development generating the lower rates of femicide. It was specifically associated with the um, political re representation. That work I published in 2009, that was the Globalization and Inequalities. So the data from that um, isn't yesterday. And since then, we've seen an increase in the use of quotas in getting more women into parliaments. So I think there'll be an interesting question as to whether that changes that correlation or not. And I don't know the answer to that. But at the point where I did the analysis, uh, there was much less use of quotas to get women into the parliament. So it had a different meaning uh, than it might do today. But I think underlying your question is picking up on two different theoretical models about the relationship between forms of inequality and violence against women. One model is a kind of cumulative one, that is the more inequality, the more violence. So if you reduce the amount of inequality, you reduce the amount of violence. It's a model in which all of these things just line up in a very linear fashion uh, in, in, in that nature of the system. There's another model, which is a backlash model, 
which is that if you reduce the amount of inequality in one area, then you might get an increase of inequality in another. In particular, you might get the use of violence as a consequence of the reduced inequality in one area, so that you have a backlash. At a micro level, you can think of that as, at that moment, for example, if a woman gets sufficient independence she considers leaving, that's one of the most dangerous moments. And so just at that moment, might, you might say that she, there's a reduction in the gender inequality because she's about to, uh, then that's lethal. So we've got two different theoretical models linking the systems of inequality with the rates of violence. I think they both have validity. And the question is, which one is in play at any particular moment in time? And the analysis that I presented to you uh, which was about the correlation between rates of femicide and rates of women in Parliament, are based on that simple notion of simple accumulation. The more, the more inequality, the more violence, the less inequality, the less violence. But I think the, uh, the other part of it, which is about a potential backlash, sits there as well that we need to investigate and, and take account of. And that might be something that you were trying to reach with in your question. Um, war. Yes, it's a form of violence. All of these forms of violence are interconnected. Again, one of the kinds of analysis I did was to see how many indicators of violence I could find and put in a data set globally and gender them. And I used um, the extent of government spending on the military as um, one of my indicators. And what we have is a correlation between the amount of expenditure on the military and rates of homicide, that is, um, rates, of w rates of propensity to war, if I take military expending as an example of that, and rates of interpersonal violence as measured by homicide, correlate. So these forms of violence are interconnected. It's exactly what you would expect and sits behind most of the intellectual agenda, behind the women, peace and security agenda, which is to say that these forms of violence are interconnected it's a very complex web of interconnection. I, I can give you a very simple empirical correlation, but the nature of the theoretical interconnections between them is really quite complicated. I do want to make the claim that this constitutes a single institutional domain in which these forms of violence are interconnected, even as I also want to make the claim that they're connected with other uh, institutional domains in society, the polity, the economy, and the civil society. Um, so, no, I didn't give you much account of war in this particular talk, um, but I could have done, and you're quite right to bring it up. Yep. Um, Foucault. Am I too, too hard on Foucault? <laughs> okay. Let, let me be, um, congratulate feminist ingenuity <laughs> in the utilisation of Foucault to make an analysis uh, of certain kinds of power. I think there's been extraordinary feminist creativity, intellectual creativity, in the utilization of that body of work um, in order to um, understand uh, forms of power. So, yes. I was more concerned here with his macro theorization, um, which I think implied that there was a reduction in the utilization of violence by the state and I think he's empirically incorrect. And I think almost in terms of a gender analysis, it's almost the reverse, that we're now seeing the um, ability to utilize the state to engage with issues of violence, which weren't there in the past. So I think that Foucault's temporality is particularly problematic. Uh, I think uh, um, Engel Mary is also interesting in this and has also got some intriguing arguments about the, the temporality of Foucault on these issues of gender violence. So, so on that level of the, the changes over time, I think Foucault really is wrong, even though I want to congratulate feminist in ingenuity. Um, coercive control. All violence is coercive and controlling. Um, Domestic violence is, war is, terror is. The point of violence is often to control through fear of the violence 
rather than the actual violence. And that's part of the nature of the power that violence generates, that it's got this big kind of penumbra, this great big lurking hinterland of power, which is an intrinsic part of the physicality of the power, but is in some ways is different from it. I think the, the gender analysis here is really interesting, which is to ask the question, what is the relationship between the physicality of violence and all of these other forms of control? Now, the way you posed the question, you separated them and asked if we could have legislation on coercive control, which didn't subsume the physical violence to it, but kept it separate. And I would agree with you. And in a sense, that was originally the trajectory of the legislation, because we were developing legislation on harassment and stalking. Uh, 1996 or 7 was when we have had the first harassment acts, um, which meant that if the same action was repeated two or more times and caused fear, <coughs> alarm, or distress, then it constituted a crime, even though one of those actions wouldn't have been. So we, we, we got into legislation in the late 1990s exactly that kind of legislation which legislated for the, the, the coercive controlling uh, implications of particular kinds of non-physical harassment. It was wonderful legislation. It was never applied to a cohabiting couple. And why wasn't it? Well, for whatever reason, it wasn't. And I think some of the early discussions about coercive control were about the removal of the cohabitation exemption. You might say it was a bit like rape. We removed the marital exemption in the 1990s. You couldn't be charged with rape if you were, uh, if you were married. We removed the marital exemption. Is, should we have simply removed the cohabitation exemption on harassment? And then that would have kept this legislation very clearly about non-physical things and recognised that the repetition of certain kinds of behaviours has a, a, a coercive and controlling effect which crosses a threshold of horror which uh, it's appropriate to deem to be criminal. And that would have been good. But I think what we ended up with was a bit of a mishmash and a bit of a, a mixing of things. And so the actual crime as it went on to the statute book, put all of these things together and mixed up the physical violence and the non-physical violence. And I'm not sure that was a wise mix in the legislation. I think it would have been better to have simply removed the cohabitation exemption from the existing laws on harassment. And then we could have kept it separate as a crime. And then we could, as, as social scientists, have kept going with, well, what is the relationship between them? Do you have the coercion first and the violence follows? Or does the violence have to occur first before the, the threats work as effectively? That is, I think that we have a question as to what is the nature of the interrelationship between the physical violence and the, and the fear and the forms of control, and what is the interrelationship between them? And I would like to investigate that rather than to make assumptions um, that they're all just the same package. So analytically, I'm always wanting to separate things so I can ask about the interrelationship between them rather than just lump them together. All right, let's take another round of questions. Uh, yeah, over there. Hello. Uh, thank you for a really good talk and for the work you do and for sticking it to the Office of National Statistics. I cannot believe that bit. I'm still reeling. Um, I, as well, have loads and loads of questions. Um, but when you mentioned the UN at the beginning, I just wanted to ask, has the kind of development of human rights internationally been a useful tool for your work at all in, in your work? As in, we were told in the 40s that men and women both have equal rights. Has that been useful? And the, all the systems around that. Mm -hmm. Yep, over there. 
Thank you. Um, so I have a fairly technical question um, regarding um, how to record gender for all types of violent crime, so how to disaggregate the data and the various, the various categories that you gave that should be included in the measurement of different types of violence or different types of crime. One of them was gender motivation. And I'm sorry, I'm sure I can find the answer by reading your paper, but since we're here. Um, I was wondering if you could um, just expand on that and how that would be measured. And just to contextualize that, I'm linking that to the discourse on gender-based violence in a humanitarian space that's you know, going towards a, we all have a gender, therefore any crime is gendered. And um, so how do you retain a sense of a gender motivation um, within or against that. Okay. Any more questions? Oh, yep. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I, I wanted to pick up on um, your drawing of violence as a field of power and as an um, institutional domain. Um, and I was wondering how broadly you would, you would draw that field, whether you would just focus on um, interpersonal, body-to-body, -body immediate violence, or whether you would extend that to, for example, um, uh, Nixon's concept of slow violence as, for example, environmental degradation or destruction carried out by multinational corporations, like the Bhopal disaster, or whether you would also extend it over time and space, looking at inter intergenerational uh, kind of forms of violence and trauma as passed on um, through spaces and, and across time. Thank you. And I'll take, was there a question there? Yeah, up there. Um, hi. Um, so at the beginning of the, the talk, the title was about going towards zero violence. Um, and I think it's very important that we've, that you've outlined all the ways that, that gender needs to, gender violence needs to be uh, kept separate and all these kind of things um, to highlight that there is an issue in, in, a, in a political space. Um, but what kind of practical or structural um, changes, uh, initiatives do you think there needs to be in order to get towards re reaching this kind of ambitious goal of zero violence? What, what, what you know, um, I really like this idea of gender disagree in the act of assault, for example, and getting that, um, that to, to, to make more visible um, the, the, the statistics on crime, but where do we go from that towards actually um, practically implementing steps to, to reduce crime rates? Thank you. Okay. Um, the UN has long had two different routes through which it can engage with uh, gender issues and violence issues. One of them has been human rights, and the other has been uh, gender discrimination. And, and they've sat there uh, adjacent to each other, sometimes mixed up as in the Beijing plat platform, uh, and sometimes they're separated. Um, CEDAW um, has focused particularly on gender discrimination, but the human rights focus has, has more often been mobilized in relationship to violence. So I think there have been two different kind of legal and philosophical bases for mobilizing a kind of gender justice case within um, EU leg um, UN legal principles. Um, human rights has mobilized in very interesting ways. It enabled the kind of 1993 um, mobilization inside the UN to declare that women's rights were human rights, um, which was a contestation of the notion that human rights were um, already available to everybody. And it was a challenge, and it was said, no, they're not yet available, we have to name it specifically. And it was an attempt to also at the same time to get violence against women named as a violation of women's human rights. So as it, yeah, um, in Vienna, 1993, um, the declaration, um, DIVOR, yeah. That, that was a very important moment um, for the UN. Um, and the UN is a very important body in norm setting sometimes asked about norms. Um, the UN often works by norms. And so, and the mixing of what's legal and what's normative in, in the UN is a really interesting, because quite often the, the legal 
has very little impact unless they can mobilise a kind of moral, uh, a normative argument behind it. So the human rights space has very often been mobilised in that kind of discursive um, and moral uh, manner. What does it actually deliver? Here you see me walk to this other um, body of kind of legal principles, which is much more focused upon notions of gender discrimination and the mobilization and, and the institutionalization of that within institutions. And I think that's been more successfully uh, institutionalized in legal institutions than has that of human rights. Now, I think that's up for argument. Um, I think with, certainly within, for example, the European Union, um, gender equality is institutionalized through notions of equal rights, and human rights is kind of lurks in the background. Whereas I think at the level of the UN, it's been much more mobilized through notions of human rights. Um, it only works, in fact, there's been a mobilization behind it, so in and of itself, um, it, it's not sufficient. So a note of caution, while at the same time, a kind of welcome for it. Yeah. Um, gender motivation. Um, I'm deeply ambivalent about whether or not it's appropriate to write motivation into criminal law. It sits there inside homicide law because it differentiates between whether or not somebody is committing murder or manslaughter um, you have to have intended to kill somebody for it to be murder. If you didn't intend to kill them, you might intend to hurt them and not kill them, then it's manslaughter. Or you kill them in self-defense or something. The, the, the motivation matters for the distinctions which are made within the, con the concept of homicide. And it's probably right that that occurs for something as serious as homicide. What we've seen is the mobilization of the notion of motivation behind some notions of hate crime where it's treated as an aggravation. So assault which is racially motivated is regarded as aggravated and there's an additional penalty in criminal law if it's motivated on a racial basis. There's been some arguments about whether some crimes of gender-based violence should be treated in exactly the same way as hate. And there's an ambivalence about that because motivation is really hard to prove. Really, really hard to prove. And should you have to prove motivation in order to prove that the assault took place? And most of the time it's probably difficult enough to prove the assault in criminal law without having the requirement that you prove motivation as well. So I'm quite cautious about the inclusion of motivation within criminal law, while at the same time recognizing that in some very specific circumstances, it's been found useful to do so, aggregated racial assaults and the distinction between homicide and, and murder. Um, but I would be cautious about pushing for further crimes on which motivation has to be proved rather than simply the action and the effect of the action. Um, caution. Um, okay, Def definition of violence. Um, you'll see I've been using a very narrow definition, deliberately, because I want to separate it from other forms of power and other forms of harm. Environmental, de environmental degradation um, clearly uh, leads to loss of life. It leads, leads to all sorts of suffering and harm. I don't want to call it violence because I want to treat violence as something as a distinct form of power. So it's not that I want to underestimate the extent of the harms, economic inequality, um, environmental degradation, cause to human beings, but I think they're different. And I don't want to lose the specificity of violence. I want to keep its specificity. So I think in too much of social theory, 
violence against women has been swept away and submerged into other categories and been called symbolic and called something else. And we've lost the capacity to say it's important as a consequence of the lack of a recognition of it as a concept, as a theoretical object in its own right. And for that reason, I want to hang on to a narrow definition of violence and not extend it in the way, for example, that Gal Tung does to kind of the way that social structures generates unnecessary death. Clearly, inequal economic inequality generates unnecessary death, but I don't want to call that violence. I want to recognize it as it's the harms that economic inequality cause in their own right, and I want to separate it from the harms that physical contact violence, intended physical contact violence, cause. I think there are different forms of institutions, different forms of power, and it helps our analysis to be able to separate them and then we can ask about the interconnections, but I want to separate them b before I do that. Okay. How do we end violence? Is that your question? Yeah. Okay. So, what's my theory of violence? You've seen, first of all, I want to name it as a field. I want to be able to make it visible. I want to be able to treat it as, as an object, theoretically and empirically, and name it so it can become an object of analysis, a political object, a policy object. Yeah? And then you've also seen me engage with it as part of society. And we change violence partly by changing it within the institution of violence and partly as a consequence of changing its relationship with other forms of institutional domains, economy, polity, and civil society. So you'll have heard the, the discussion about the extent to which political representation, reducing inequalities in political representation will reduce violence. So democracy is a mechanism for reducing violence. I don't think we'd ever reach zero violence without democracy, without reducing gender gaps in political representation of women and men. So inequalities in the polity matter, inequalities in economy matter. You've seen that discussion about the extent to which um, the resilience of victims changes the likelihood of the repetition of the violence. Economic inequality matters. So we would need that. So the theory for the movement towards the ending of violence requires a theory which analyzes the significance of reducing economic inequality, political inequality, and also inequalities in civil society, which change how we can make representations and think about it. But it also means thinking about the relationship between the different kinds of violence. War is part of this. It's unlikely that you would stop interpersonal violence if there is still interstate violence and intergroup violence, you're not going to stop one without another. All of these different kinds of violence are intricately interconnected. So I'm giving you a theory of society in order to give you a theory of the change in violence. And it's predominantly a theory which connects inequalities in society in these different institutional domains of economy, polity, and civil society, and connecting that with the theorization of violence. And then that potentially gives us a route to thinking about imagining a situation of zero violence. All right, are there any final questions? A quick one? Yeah, really quick. Okay, alright. How are you defining institution? I'm a sociologist. For me, a soci uh, an institution is for me a taken for granted concept in which we're talking about institution, uh, we're talking about practices 
which are replicated whether or not the individuals know that they're replicating them. So an institution is a system, it's a social system, which is a self-reproducing social system. Yeah. All right, if there are no further questions, please join me in thanking Sylvia.